In modern biotechnology, scientists are tasked with solving widespread health complications, such as heart disease, Alzheimer's, and cancer. Every year, new drugs hit the market with the hope of tackling these issues so we can live longer and healthier lives. The research that goes into the development of therapeutic solutions requires a well-exercised foundation of physics and biology. The manipulation of lasers, sensors, and computers creates valuable insight into the world of molecular biology with many techniques offering their own pros and cons. One of these techniques is called fluorescence and isotropy. But before we get there, here's a quick refresher on how fluorescence works. You may be familiar with a process called luminescence, which is when a substance emits light without the use of heat. Fluorescence is a type of luminescence that you can find happening in certain jellyfish, cosmetic makeups, highlighter pens, and it is even used in sutures to help surgeons see better. Let's take a closer look. Fluorescence happens when a ground state singlet absorbs a photon and temporarily increases its energy state. At this point, it's possible that the electron will experience non-radiative loss of energy in the form of vibrational energy, but this is not fluorescence. After absorbing the photon, the electron is less stable at its higher energy state and will drop back down to a lower orbital. To do so, it will spontaneously emit a photon, and this is where fluorescence occurs. Quick reminder, this entire process is just one of many ways an excited electron can transfer energy to go back to the most thermodynamically stable state. We still have phosphorescence, pair formation, and other types of scattering that won't be covered in this video. We understand how fluorescence works. So what exactly is fluorescence and isotropy? With respect to biophysics, the entire process is just to measure how well two molecules bind to each other. The experiment goes something like this. You take a laser and shine it through a filter. That light is now plane polarized. There are at least two molecules that can interact with each other. One is the fluorophore, and the other forms a chemical bond with it. As their chemical bond brings them closer and closer, their angular momenta combine, and that's what we're looking for. Shine that polarized laser light at the fluorophore, and emission begins. Pass it through another filter, we take our measurements from a detector, and we're done. That's the basic rundown, but we can do better. Let's rewind and take a closer look at things. The reason for that first filter? Light actually travels in a wave along an axis. However, it's not so straightforward. Millions of photons are being emitted over a few seconds and they are randomly oriented. The filter is polyvinyl alcohol plastic, doped with iodine, stretched only a few nanometers thin, about the wavelength of our laser light. If the laser light is not oriented along the pass-through axis, it is converted into vibrational energy or heat energy in the filter, and does not pass through. If it is oriented correctly, it passes through, and will strike our fluorophore. Once it hits, the fluorophore will only emit light if there's a good enough absorption dipole along the molecule. Now, this is the important part. The intensity of light emitted is dependent on how parallel the electric field vector of our filtered laser light is to our absorption dipole. If it's perpendicular, you can get no emission of light, but this is rare due to how many molecules will be in the solution. The definition of anisotropy is the angle theta between the absorption vector and the emission vector of our fluorophore. 
Some molecules will have a higher intensity light simply due to electric field vector perpendicularity. And this is called photoselection. Using some trigonometry, we find the light intensities are given by cosine squared theta for the parallel axis and sine squared phi times sine squared theta for the perpendicular. The electric field created during emission by the fluorophore is given by the Coulomb constant times sine theta over r, and we can square this entire field for the light intensity. Then, when the fluorophore binds to its target, their angular momenta are combined. Big molecules spin slow and small ones fast, which means now our fluorophore, combined with the larger molecule, is rotating slower. This rotational diffusion will displace the emission dipole, and now we can form a relationship between angular momentum, molecular volume, and anisotropy. Add another filter and detector so we can measure the parallel and perpendicular light intensities. Where polarization P equals the intensity of parallel light minus the intensity of the perpendicular light all over the sum of the two. While this is enough information to make meaningful predictions, one of our perpendicular axes is unaccounted for. If we normalize our polarization value with respect to the total emission, it's called anisotropy. To switch between the two easily, let's quickly derive a conversion equation. Much better. Now, we can do some truly groundbreaking biophysics. Viscosity, binding affinity, fluorescent quenching, and more are all derived from this in Francis Perrin's original paper, published in 1966. We understand how fluorescence and isotropy works, but there's one question scientists who develop new medicines frequently need to answer, and that is, does my potential new medicine even bind to its target? And if so, how tightly? We're going to do some simplified calculations to answer this for a mock trial. Again, the whole point of fluorescence and isotropy, with respect to biophysics, is to measure how tightly two molecules will bind to each other. So it goes like this. We have a small fluorescent molecule, a dandel acid, that is our fluorophore. And we have a larger molecule called bovine serum albumin that is used to help grow cells in a lab. We want to find what their affinity for each other may be. Bovine serum albumin, BSA, has a total of seven binding sites for fatty acids. And due to the structure of dandel acids, these sites are where we're going to find our fluorescent probe binds to. We'll need a few polarization values taken from our detector, and we'll also need some known concentrations. First, the polarization value, if we have some concentration of DNS, our dandel acid, bound to an excessive amount of BSA, much, much more BSA than we have DNS. Then, the polarization of both compounds, with BSA at some concentration where not all of it is bound. And finally, the polarization of just DNS with no BSA in the solution at all. Let's convert these to anisotropy using our conversion equation. Now, the total anisotropy is given by this equation. The fraction of free fluorophore times its unbound anisotropy scaled by its quantum yield. Add the same thing, but using values from our bound state. Then divide that by the sum of the products of the free and bound states, and again, each scaled by the quantum yield. If we realize that adding the free and bound state fractions gives us one, we can do some algebra to obtain a nice simplified form of this equation. Now, all we have to do is plug in to solve for our fractions of free and unbound fluorophore. Scale this ratio by the concentration of BSA and we have our binding affinity in KDA. A smaller KDA means a higher affinity between the two. Larger KDA means they're not very likely to bind to each other, if at all. Perhaps the two most popular values we can obtain from this technique are the binding affinity between two molecules, as we just solved for, and the molecular volume of our ligand, which is just how big things are. 
For instance, if there's a cellular membrane too complex to create meaningful images out of, we can use fluorescence anisotropy and molecular volume calculations to help figure out the lay of the land. As for binding affinity, fluorescence anisotropy is often the go-to technique for this. Some scientists use a fluorometer hundreds to thousands of times a year, and it can be heavily automated to save time and cost. Plenty of information exists about this technique and the derivations of how the quantum mechanics and electromagnetic fields play into it. A particularly well-written text authored by Joseph R. Lakowitz covers a lot of this, and a link to purchase it is in the description. That's it for this video. Thank you for watching and have a great day.